I don't know what it is about me. Maybe I just have suckified written on my increasingly large forehead, and only those with plenty of baggage to unload can read it. My coworker, we'll call her Lena, asked me to lock her office door after I stepped in to drop off a contract. Then, in a tremulous voice, she recounted a side business deal that she had formed with who she believed to be her partners. Of course, that day she found out that they had just cut her out of the deal right before the getting was green. After her confession followed the inevitable. Her eyes brimmed with tears, bordering on overflow, which was my cue to hug her. As she began to ruin my nice shirt with her blend of tears and makeup, I told her that she was right to feel how she felt, and if she had to cry, then cry. While she sobbed, I acknowledged the betrayal that she suffered, but I told her that it would soon become the past, and she would come out of the experience wiser. I then asked her to do me a favor. For God's sake, Lena, please don't go dark on me. That's exactly what I asked her. Please don't go dark because I didn't want her terrible experience to justify being meaner and crueler to others in future ventures, screwing over others the way she was screwed over by her partners. Be wary? Yes. Act stronger? Sure. Avoid being so overly trusting? Absolutely. But you can still be kind. You can always be kind. Just don't expect kindness in return. That's for the other person to decide. That's the other person's problem. But every once in a while you'll run into the occasional foolish idealist. And I swear to you, Lena, I swear to you that your kind manner in a world full of motherless fucks will be appreciated. And if we're all lucky, that fool that you show kindness to will show kindness to others. It was then that I caressed the back of her head in a there-there fashion as her sobs began to subside. Then I gradually moved my hand to the top of her head, where I then began to apply subtle pressure in a crotchward direction hoping that she'd get the hint. Upon feeling her kneecap make brutal contact with my magnificent testicles, I realized she might have gotten the wrong idea. With tears in my eyes, I asked, Lesbian? With rage in her eyes, she asked, Pig? Ugh, I should have known. A feminist. Had I known she was one of those, I'd have approached her differently. You see, fellas, the way to handle one of these fucking feminists is to play nice. And then you invite her over to your place, and you give her a glass from the Cosby Vineyard selection. And once she's out for the count, you sneak her over to your home in the country and subject that bitch to bondage, torture, and mind games. <laughs> At least that's what the absolute base Chad of the 1969 film The Laughing Woman does. His name is Sayer, and his latest lady to be taught this important lesson is Maria, an employee at the philanthropic organization that he runs. While discussing an assignment, Maria makes the mistake of telling Sayer that she's in favor of male sterilization. And I guess it's not enough that he responds with a, well, actually, for the ages. Because he then invites her over to his apartment for a couple of friendly drinks between employees. Which, as mentioned earlier, is really just a prelude to Sayer breaking the poor girl's spirit. For a long time, I only knew of this film because I was a fan of the music score by the late, great Stelvio Cipriani. But it wasn't until the here and now that I actually watched the film that it was made for. But unless you're into this sort of thing, the stuff Sayer subjects Maria to can be tough to watch. He ties her up, he ties her down, he tapes her mouth shut, and forces her to watch him enjoy breakfast. He turns a goddamn fire hose on the woman. Worst of all, he forces Maria to rub oil on his disgusting bare man feet. That alone would be enough for me to wish for death. Which is, in fact, what Sayer wants of his guest, by the way, as he later casually confesses to Maria that he kills his female guests to achieve sexual climax. <sighs> Look, I'm not going to kink shame the man. I mean, whatever floats your boat, right? Some guys, they can't come unless they have a finger in their ass. Uh, other guys, they need to be asphyxiated. And then you have the real weirdos who can't come unless they insert their penis into an orifice. Either way, I don't judge. Now... Normally, as a coward with a tiny d Now, normally, as a real man with a fast car, I don't mind watching women in movies learn their place. But the problem is that Lysander's character resembles none other than the adorable Amy Adams, specifically during her Lois Lane days. And since Superman wasn't coming over to save this damsel in distress, I wanted this fucking asshole sayer to die a thousand penis and or anus related deaths. Written and directed by Piero Schivazappa, and also known under the title Femina Ridens and The Frightened Woman, 
I can see some calling this film yet another misogynistic portrayal of attractive women in dangerous situations, and I can see some calling this a feminist critique on what overly sensitive and destructive man-babies we males are. I think both parties are right, because this is one of those deals that has it both ways, and depending on your point of view, the ending works either as a justification or an excuse for what preceded it. The film's refusal to make its stance explicit for the average viewer kind of reminded me of an S. Craig Zoller joint in that it's super fucking questionable as far as the filmmaker's personal politics, but goddamn if it ain't an excellent film all the same. I also feel that maybe there wouldn't be so much doubt about the film's intentions had this been written and directed by a woman rather than a dude. An Italian dude in the 1960s, no less. Actually, I take that back. Had a chick made this flick, it would be seen as misandrist. Nevertheless, I really like this movie. It has a pretty whacked out sense of humor that only makes everything more unsettling. And somewhere along the way, just as I figured out where this film was headed, it instead takes a detour, a welcome detour, that was less disturbing, more wacky, but just as entertaining. Visually, it's a real treat. It's a nicely photographed assortment of snazzy late 60s outfits and super stylish set design, everything looking very pop art and mod. Most of the film is set in Sayers' country getaway house that is full of furniture that looks aesthetically pleasing but uncomfortable to actually use. There's also a dream sequence involving a giant art installation that looks like a woman's spread legs with a razor-lined door placed exactly where you'd expect it to be. Philippe Leroy and Dagmar Lysander are both great in their roles as Sayer and Maria. Sayer comes off cold and calculating, that is, whenever he is in total control. But as the film continues, it becomes more clear that it is indeed all just an attempt at appearing strong while holding in his emotions. Because as we all know, emotions are for women. He meets his match with Maria, who despite being held against her will, despite being knocked down both figuratively and literally, gives as good as she gets. Because a strong-willed woman can only do so much when you have some proto-red-pill-taking motherfucker standing in her way. And come on, dude, just because Lysander kind of looks like Amy Adams doesn't mean I'm actually watching Amy Adams. And so when Maria danced while slowly taking off what looked like a swimsuit made of white gauze, I felt no shame, no need to tell the precious star of Arrival and Enchanted to stop debasing herself for our perverted carnal pleasure. Because it wasn't Amy Adams. It was someone else. No. Instead, I said, Take that shit off, you fucking whore! <laughs> the private domain of the developed connoisseur. Exposing the obsessive bondage that very special men and women enjoy over each other with the internationally famous Philippe Leroy as Sayer, a sadist, expert in bizarre punishments, a complete master of the most exquisite techniques of mental and physical torture. Dagmar Lysander as Maria, his prisoner. Philippe Leroy and Dagmar Lysander. Quite unlike anything you have ever experienced before, a peculiar bondage in which both master and slave are inescapably trapped. You will never entirely forget this revealing motion picture experience. Of the current new releases at the local cinema, the prequel to Ty West's film X, Pearl, stood out. Unlike its successor, which was a dark and gritty throwback to Grindhouse flicks and brought to mind the early works of Toby Hooper, Pearl takes a different approach that brings to mind the works of Douglas Sirk, an overly bright and polished technicolor widescreen melodrama with a lush music score reminiscent of Frank Skinner and Dmitry Tiomkin. Set in 1918, the film follows the murderous, psycho-freaky oldster from X, the titular Pearl, back when she was just a young adult with zero human kills under her belt. Played by Mia Goth, 
Pearl lives on a farm in Texas with her parents, while her husband Howard is overseas fighting in the First World War. With one man out of the country and her father infirm, it is up to Pearl and her mother to share in the everyday chores and various household responsibilities. Any spare moment she has, Pearl uses to unwind. For example, she's fond of dancing in the barn to a rapt audience of cows and chickens, which reminded me of something Oprah Winfrey once said in an interview about how when she was a little kid, she would entertain herself by playing to an audience of chickens in a coop. I forgot exactly what this plane consisted of, so I couldn't tell you whether she sang to the chickens or interviewed the chickens or gave the chickens free cars. But unlike Oprah, God, at least I hope so, Pearl is shown to be wearing a mask of sanity which has a tendency to slip every once in a while. We witness such slippage during the opening scene, when Pearl indulges the psychopathic murderer underneath by casually picking up a pitchfork and using it to stab a goose who was not invited to her barnyard show. She then feeds the goose to an alligator at the lake, and we're left with the sense that this isn't the first time something like this has happened. I reckon that alligator's been eating good for quite a while. I thought it was pretty clever for West to set this film during the Spanish flu pandemic. We watch Pearl ride her bike into town to pick up medicine for her father, and upon arrival, she puts on her face mask, because that's what people did back then. They didn't have the internet. The only place the crazies had to share their wackadoo conspiracies was on the street corners, where they'd shout their thoughts or picket with signs, all the while being justly ignored. Unfortunately, today, the same kind of lunatics have millions of online followers, and some even hold political office. In the interest of retaining any listeners from the other side of the argument, I offer this alternate version of the previous paragraph. I thought it was pretty clever for West to set this film during the Spanish flu pandemic. We watch Pearl ride her bike into town to pick up medicine for her father, and upon arrival, she puts on her face mask, because that's what people did back then. They didn't have the internet. People were easily led sheep who questioned nothing and accepted what the government told them, and those who knew the truth were unfairly ignored. Fortunately today, similar truth-tellers share their knowledge with millions of online followers, and some even hold political office. During one scene, Pearl goes to the movie theater, and while watching the chorus girls on screen, she briefly pulls up her mask in order to take a sip from her father's bottle of morphine. At the same time, I briefly pulled up my mask in order to take a pull of bourbon from my flask. Realizing this moment of synchronicity between film character, film viewer, and time periods, back then there was a global pandemic, there were countries at war, and an increasing worldwide partiality to fascist regimes. Today, we're in a global pandemic, we have countries at war, and there's an increasing worldwide partiality to fascist regimes. I thought, wow, next verse, same as the first. At that point, I felt a kinship with Pearl. And to be painfully honest, I even identified with her a couple times in ways that I'll keep disconcertingly private. As far as murderous tendencies go, I'm possibly worse than Pearl. Because while she goes around stabbing geese, I prefer to choke the chicken. While she takes out people who are standing in the way of her dreams, I enjoy distracting my loneliness by extinguishing millions of potential doctors, astronauts, and school shooters. Pearl's dream is to become a dancer in the big city, and it's something that absolutely has to happen for her. There is no other option. She has to leave her stifling existence on that farm with its laborious obligations set upon her by her overly stern, a.k.a. German, mother. Upon making the acquaintance of a kind and handsome projectionist, she sees not just temporary company sans hubby, but a possible ticket to dreamland, population Pearl. But knowing what we know about this character, at least those of us who've seen X, we might not be aware of what will happen or how, but we do know what the final outcome is going to be. And so we watch the setup as things begin to look promising for Pearl while awaiting the inevitable heartbreak plus the aftermath that will surely follow. Those expecting a slasher horror film may be disappointed. This is more of an off-kilter character study that eventually results in some bloodshed. Come to think of it, I think this qualifies as an entry in the God's Lonely Man subgenre, alongside recent examples like Joker and Saint Maud. The tone of the film straddles the line between sincere and winking, which can put some people off as well. But I really dug this, and I think this works better as a film than X. A huge part of why this film worked for me is Mia Goth's performance as Pearl, who I found having lots of sympathy for, despite her violent inclinations. She's a sicko, all right, but she's also very earnest. The climax of the film hinges on the strength of the actor at the center of it, rather than on gore or suspense. And that's because the climax of the film isn't a kill spree, 
but a monologue. But holy shit, what a monologue. And what a delivery. Hers is the kind of performance that leaves me of two beliefs. One, Mia Goth is a great actress. And two, Mia Goth is a broken human being. And I'm thinking... ¿Por qué no las dos? I mean, most great actors are both of those things. Hence, their ability to pull such effective expressions of genuine emotion. Plus, she's hooked up with Shia LaBeouf and has a kid with him. So you fucking know that's some extra pain to pull from. Some people are talking Oscar buzz for goth, which I doubt will happen. Not because I don't think she deserves such accolades, but because the Academy treats horror movies the way they treat the troubling past histories of some of their award recipients. They ignore them. And don't give me this, what about Get Out bullshit. At most, that was an anomaly. And I think the large assortment of old white people who voted for it probably gave Jordan Peele his best original screenplay, not because he wrote an excellent film and deserved the award, which he did, but because he put the idea in their rapidly aging Caucasian brains that maybe there's a chance that science will create a brain-swapping procedure that will allow them to switch places with younger black people. They awarded him for giving them hope. And this was their way of saying, Thank you, kindly black filmmaker. You're one of the good ones. Anyway, Pearl's not only a good movie, it also features one of my favorite end credits to a film, a sort of unholy blend of the closing credits to both Call Me By Your Name and the television series Police Squad. I was about to say Pearl has the most unnerving end credits I've seen in a film, but I'm going to give the edge to Call Me By Your Name, because those credits involve the child crying over his pedo-cannibal first love. Oh, I miss Oliver. Whatever, Elio. Boo fucking who. Why don't you go eat a dick? That is if the fucking Lone Ranger over here hasn't already eaten it. Caring for your family during these times is admirable. But you only get one take at this life. If only they would just die. Pardon? Nothing. Zeta! I want to be special. Dancing up on the screen like the pretty girls in the pictures. I want to be I will not let you leave this farm again. I'm worried there may be something real wrong with me. Rumor has it they only take one gal per town. We're looking for someone with X Factor. It has to be me. How about a film nobody else has seen? Is it legal? It will be eventually. I know what I've done. Bad things. Terrible, awful, murderous things. I want to be loved from as many people as possible. But truth is, I'm not really a good person. I've been trying to watch all the unopened Blu-rays on my shelf, and the latest one to rid of its shrink wrap is the five-hour director's cut of Vim Vender's 1991 epic, Until the End of the World. This ultra-ambitious sprawl of ideas takes place in the near future of 1999, where a nuclear satellite has gone haywire, thanks India, and will soon crash land somewhere on Earth, bringing its final resting place the mother of all kabooms. Sure, there are some people who are really freaked out about this, such as one man who Debbie Downers a bar full of people about how he can't believe anyone is still able to drink or hang out or try to get laid when imminent nuclear death is hovering above us. Otherwise, the majority appear to be about as worried about the situation as one can be about something that is absolutely beyond one's control. 
Which is to say, enough worry that still allows someone to continue living their lives. Because, you know, there are bills to pay and babies to raise. You know, there's life to live. It's not unlike how the world's been living ever since we got two sneak peeks of Armageddon back in 1945. And I'm not talking about the Michael Bay movie. Every so often, some tribal chief tries to establish dominance by threatening the unthinkable, flashing those nukes as if they were Glocks in a rap video. There's certainly some of that going around right now during this foul year of our Lord, 2022, with the whole Ukraine situation. I blame Rocky Balboa myself. I thought he patched things up between the Ruskies and the rest of the world back in 1985, but evidently he didn't. And now the fate of humanity depends on not pissing off this ex-KGB fuck, this overcompensating tyrant who poses bare-chested on top of horses like some ultra-closet case trying to convince everyone that he's fiercely, fiercely hetero, but only succeeds in making himself look even gayer. At best, if this asshole does end up pushing the big red button of win, he will come off as omnisexual, because he will have then fucked every one in the ass. Men, women, animal, vegetable, and mineral. Eh, but at least you're not gay, right, Todarish? Back to the movie. So yeah, people are living their lives despite potential apocalypse, and we focus on one of them, this lady named Claire, played by Solveig Domaten, who is currently getting her last weekend on by partying it up in Venice, Italy, drowning her sorrows after finding her husband Eugene, played by Sam Neill, getting super cozy with her best friend back home in Paris. Once she gets that out of her system, she decides to return, but not necessarily back to her husband. It's more like, you know how it is, your bed at home is always going to be more comfortable than a bed elsewhere, right? Sometimes there's a cheating schmuck sharing that bed with you, but what can you do? So yeah, she's driving back, but on the way she takes a detour that begins the chain of events that leads to her going on a globetrotting adventure with a man named Sam, played by William Hurt and it involves a bag of stolen money and a special device that records images that blind people will be able to see. Along the way, we see the differences and similarities between Claire and Sam. Both of them have a habit of pretending to be someone else. Claire does this by wearing a wig, and Sam does this by using aliases. But while Sam does this to avoid capture by the government agency searching for him and the special device, Claire does this, well, she does this just to take the edge off the ennui. One gets the sense that Claire is unfulfilled somehow, and that even she doesn't know what to do to fill that void. Sure, she has a habit of recording things on her little video camera, but even then, it's all very aimless, purposeless. It's, it, it's just recording for the sake of recording. For all the cutting-edge technology used in this film's version of 1999, such as talking car navigation systems and widespread use of HDTV, it was still too bright and early of a time to imagine something as evil as social media or TikTok. I'm sure if those were available, Claire would do all right spending her time posting numerous videos of herself dancing while singing along to Elvis Presley songs. Instead, she keeps herself busy by meeting Sam, losing Sam, finding Sam, losing Sam again, and then finding Sam again in a journey through France, Germany, Portugal, Russia, China, Japan, and the United States, a.k.a. the greatest country in all of God's kingdom. And don't you forget it, you godless, socialist, commie, foreign fucks. The entire journey is narrated by Eugene, who, along with a private detective, are on Claire and Sam's trail for reasons of love and money. At best, I can only describe the first half of this film as a rambling flirtation with the idea of the possibility of an international chase flick slash romantic movie. But really, it's all just an excuse for vendors to hang his ideas and thoughts on both the current state of humanity and where he sees it heading. The second half then dials it down with one final hop to South Australia, switching gears to something more cerebral, but also more emotional. It's here that we are introduced to Sam's parents, played by Max von Sydow and Jean Moreau, and where we discover that Sam's father is the inventor of the device for the blind. But we also discover that as brilliant as Sam's father is, well... As a father to Sam, he's less than adequate. I can give away plenty more and still leave a lot for you to discover, but I'll only go as far as to say that there's another future tech invention that features in the film, and it allows one to record a person's dreams, which one can then view. Now that sounds problematic enough for me, but it gets worse when a couple of characters find themselves addicted to watching their own dreams. They're glued to their little portable monitors, and they lose their shit if they run out of battery. So let's give vendors the Nostradamus Award, because the people in this film don't look much different from you or me when we're on our phones and tablets nowadays. Only difference is that most of us are watching other people live their dreams. But at least the people my age still know what it's like to step outside every once in a while and do things without the need of something that requires an energy source. 
I fear we might be the last generation to have that ability. God forbid an EMP knocks out the entire grid. While some of us can always find entertainment in partaking in various sports of kings, such as football, and while others can indulge in various sports of the poor and the foreign, such as soccer, any kid born after Kim Kardashian fucked Ray J is going to be lost without the internet. Some might get so despondent over not knowing what to do with their time, they might even take their own lives. Once again proving that every cloud has a silver lining. Because fuck them kids. Vendors has gone on record saying that he set out to make the ultimate road movie, which makes perfect sense. If anyone knew about making movies about interesting characters traveling cross-country, it was the director of Paris, Texas and Kings of the Road. The difference was that for this film, Vendors didn't stick to one part of the country, or hell, one country. Instead, he somehow managed to finagle over $20 million, which today would be in the neighborhood of $50 million, to make an arthouse film about the dangers of falling into the deep well of narcissism, and which would take place in nine countries and four continents, and which would be distributed by Warner Brothers, and not even give the motherfuckers a single decent action scene in the entire picture. At most, there's a really brief and goofy shootout where they don't even use muzzle flashes, just sound effects and goofy pratfall music. It's pretty wild to think about, especially today. People talk about how they don't make movies like this anymore, and I feel they're mistaken. They still make movies like this, just for much, much, much less money. While I love the ambition behind it, overall, I only liked the film. The problem for me is that despite the introduction of more emotional elements in the second half, it still fell short in getting me to actually care for any of the characters, to say nothing of even liking them. And so, I always felt detached. I was only able to observe with little to no sympathy, and only a smidge of empathy in the most extreme cases. And yes, I know that earlier in this episode I declared having sympathy and empathy for a psychotic axe murderer, yet I have little to none for a bored woman and a man trying to help blind people see. Yes, I understand. I understand I need help, and I will get help. But before I do, can I introduce you to my pet alligator? Despite its flaws, this is still very much a film by Vin Vendors, and so it works as a film that one can just simply vibe to. The whole thing left me feeling as if I had just witnessed the last magnificent and desperate gasp of the kind of offbeat indie and arthouse movies that were everywhere in the 1980s. It's as if Vendors knew that these kinds of movies were going to be an endangered species in the 90s, and so he figured that while the getting was good, why not take the bastards for all the money he could get from them? A wise move in retrospect, because as I said before, they don't really make these kinds of movies anymore. And in my opinion, Vendors' narrative work from the 90s onward has not matched his previous films like Wings of Desire. But then that could be said about many of his contemporaries. Of the quirky filmmakers from the 1970s and 80s that I group along with him, I think only Jim Jarmusch has managed to keep his pimp hand strong and firm through the decades. Anyway, it's a great looking film shot by the late great cinematographer Robbie Mueller, who can make even the most dull settings look like they came from another universe. And I got a kick out of the mix of matte paintings blended with the real locations. It's also a great sounding film, because Vendor's got a very impressive roster of artists to contribute songs to the film. U2, Talking Heads, R.E.M., Depeche Mode, Elvis Costello, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, and many more. I know it's an overused cliché of a line, but the soundtrack really is just as much a character in this film as everybody else. It's no surprise to find out that while the movie bombed at the box office, the soundtrack did quite well. In conclusion, I feel Vendor's vision of the future in Until the End of the World is a positive one, and I base that simply on the fact that there's a scene where a boy uses the power glove to make phone calls on his video phone. Because only an unabashed optimist could see any kind of future for that piece of shit. Santa Teresa, Santa Anna, Santa 1999 was the year the Indian nuclear satellite went out of control. No one knew where it might land. The whole world was alarmed. Claire couldn't care less. Can I help you? Your eyes, it's my eyes. You have sad eyes. <laughs> I'm not a sad man, though. He's got a gun. What's he after? He wants to kill me. What for? That camera takes pictures that blind people can see. I know you stole it. It's 
real name is Faber. Sam Faber. Finders me $500,000. And would you take me out of here? We is Sam Faber now. It's the end of the world. This may startle you, Judge. What's he doing? He's trying to record his own dreams. I shouldn't be saying this. Then it's one a person and the other sitting as you step by a window. Nineteen ninety-nine was the year the Indian nuclear satellite went out of control. It soared above the ozone layer like a lethal bird of prey. Claire couldn't care less. Those were just a few of the movies that I watched while nursing the pain in my balls. I still can't believe Lena did that. It's like, some women, they just don't get it, man. I'm just an old school gentleman, that's all. I mean, that's what I keep telling my coworkers, my boss, human resources, the cops, my lawyer. But they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to hear about it. I guess that's the goddamn woke liberal feminist agenda for you. Let's go, Brandon. This has been the Exiled from Contentment podcast, recorded live in front of an empty room. Exiled from Contentment has been brought to you by anger, paranoia, resentment, depression, low self-esteem, and Bradley cigarettes, now with less nicotine and less throat irritants. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, if your cigarette tastes different, smoke Rally. Episodes of this podcast can be downloaded at efcontentment.podbean.com. That's E as in EGADS. This asshole's podcast is terrible. F as in fuck this asshole's terrible podcast. Contentment as in something this asshole hasn't felt in a very long time. Dot pod as in podcast as in everybody's got their own goddamn podcast nowadays. And bean as in what the Mexican-American host of this podcast probably eats every day. Am I right, real Americans? The Exiles from Contentment podcast can also be downloaded at exilesfromcontentment.blogspot.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as EF Contentment, all one word. Follow or friend us so we can then immediately have your tweets and posts muted in order for us to have a higher friend and follower count while pretending that we care about you. You can also email us at exiledfromcontentment at gmail.com. Until our next ramblings, this is Princess Sparkle for the Exiled from Contentment podcast saying take care and be well. <laughs>